Uh, tell us your full name and your birth date. Merle Jervis, October 27th, 1924. So where were you born at? I was born in Vermilion Township at Hayesville, Ohio. So what did your folks do for a living when you were growing up? Uh, mostly farming and dad worked at Melco, the electric plant for a while. He just different places. He did work a, a lot of years at one place. What was it like when you were growing up in the Great Depression? Well, you it was it wasn't easy <laughs> it was uh, jobs was hard to get when you got a job why you wanted to keep it if it was possible uh, I, I for myself I got lawn, I mowed lawns with the old push mower lawn mower I'd walk a mile each way for, for the farmers and, and some of them had pretty big yards and in the fall, I had a neighbor, that, a big farmer, and I uh, cut corn and done a little bit of everything. Or made hay, and we, uh, you, you, you work for a living. You worked, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. <laughs> what did you, what was there for entertainment? So let's say at the end of the day, or maybe on the weekend, and a lot of the chores and work was done. What did you guys do to entertain yourselves, maybe as a family or individually? Well, for mostly for entertainment, us kids would, at night, we would have what they called uh, pest hunts. And we would have so many points for so many sparrows. If we got up in a straw stack, we'd go to straw stacks and get sparrows. And we got so many points for each sparrow and rats and so on and uh, that was one of the things that we did that kept us pretty busy <laughs> so but, how, uh, how did you get the sparrows and rats what did you use our hands oh no the rats we didn't know the rats we trapped and shot we shot them with a 22 rifle and, and trapped them uh, well, yeah. what was a typical day like uh, when you were growing up well get out of bed in the morning and when school was in of course we had to walk about a half a mile to the bus to school bus and uh, we got out of school I, we walked home and my brother Bob and I would head for the wood pile and the saw buck and the cross cut saw and and we would saw wood to might say till dark sometimes and, uh, to feed it into the stove in <laughs> So we had some pretty cold winters back back in them days. Yeah. What was your weekly income when you were working? How much did you make a week, or how much <laughs> did you make an hour? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I mowed yard for 35 cents, 35 cents uh, an hour. Or no, 35 cents for mowing the yard. Yeah, for the whole, for just mowing the whole yard, yeah, 35 cents. What was Merle focused on? Uh, let's say, you know, that 16, 17, 18 years old, that, 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 that time frame. Mm -hmm. You know, what was your mindset? And what were your, what were your future goals? Well, I always, I was, I loved to hunt. I was a hunter and I, I grew up, I guess, coon hunting, crown hog hunting, and hunting about everything that was huntable. And uh, that was my main, and then and as I got a little older, it was deer hunting, and I loved to deer hunt. That was my main, that was my main sport, was deer hunting. I loved to hunt deer. I drove to 37 years, I drove to Old Virginia every year for 37 years in the Shenandoah Mountains. <laughs> Were you hunting deer with bow or hunting them with a gun? The 30-06 rifle. So what were the major political issues? Or when you were starting to understand, I guess, the world a little bit, Yeah. Uh, what do you remember about politics, uh, the country, and the government, or maybe some worldly issues? When did that uh, start taking place for you? 
Well, I remember back when Roosevelt was running one year and Alf Landon was running against him and they had a big joke going, which they did most of the time. They said they knew why Roosevelt, why he didn't like to ride in airplanes. They said no. Well, he was afraid of landing because Alf Landon was running against him. So he was afraid of landing. He, <laughs> that, was, that was one of the jokes they had back then. <laughs> When uh, your family, were they were they more Republican or were they more Democrat growing up? Democrat. Or, yeah. More Democrat? Yeah, yeah. So what did they think of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt? The, oh, they, they loved him, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we thought a lot of him. So as you were getting into high school and you started maturing a little bit, did you realize that there was something brewing overseas at all? No, I don't believe I did. I don't believe so, no, no. Do you recall people in the town talking about some of the things that were happening overseas, especially in Germany? Uh, I can't say that I did because uh, I, I didn't, probably didn't get to town often enough, you know, to get in on that, on those kind of conversations. Uh, I don't remember, I just don't remember too much about just before the war there on the, on the talk and so on, it goes on like it does today, you know. You, you didn't have, you didn't have the, the politicians that you got now. <laughs> You know, when did you really first learn that there was a war going on over in Germany and they were conquering some of the other European nations? Well, of course, I quit school when I was 16 years old. And uh, the reason why I quit, uh, I was down in the, we had community meetings back in them days. And our community at Whittyville, up at Whittyville, all the neighbors would go up to the Hayesville to the schoolhouse and we would have our community meeting there. At one of them community meetings, we always played basketball. The kids did. So they told me to jump up on the stage and and pull a curtain shut, the big velvet curtain in the back of the stage so the ball didn't bounce up. I jumped up and I jumped up on the stage and went to pull the curtain and it pulled hard and I quit. I didn't know why, why I pulled hard. Well, here my sister and Eleanor Patterson, a friend of hers from Asia, a girl, they said that Kenny Harlan, the school board president's son, said that he tried to pull a curtain the day before when there was a missionary there. It said he jumped up off of the floor about three feet, grabbed it and hung on it, and it, it had come loose and tore three big holes in that velvet curtain. And he just pulled it back and forgot, left to go. Well then when they asked me to get up and do it, and it was, the nail was hung in one of the tears. And that's why it was hard to pull, and I quit. But Graven, Homer Graven was a, he's a Baptist preacher in the, in the church in National now, or what, I guess he still is. But anyway, Homer seen that, he was an usher, and he seen that. Well, naturally, he thought that I'd done it, you know. So he turned me in to the superintendent as if I had tore the curtain. And I hadn't, the, turn, the curtain was already tore. Well, the superintendent, we had a missionary from Africa come on a Wednesday, and a whole high school was down in the auditorium, and he had them pull the curtain shut to show them what one of their students done to their curtain. And every head turned and looked up at me when he said that, you know. They blamed me for it, because I got blamed, I got to blame for tearing the curtain. So I, I left school, I never went back, I quit. I was 16, I quit, I said, and that was it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when the U.S. was officially going to war, how did things change? Did there, or was there a rationing program? Yeah, yeah, there was a rationing. During the war, there was a rationing, you know. Uh, did, that, did the rationing, when you were stateside before you got drafted, 
did uh, did that affect you at all? No, we we was we was affected by it. Yeah, yeah, we sure was, and it was uh, it, it was uh, quite an ordeal on that. Yeah. When uh, when were you notified that you had been drafted into the service? Um, <laughs> this is where I get into trouble <laughs> when I try to remember it. Uh, Maybe not the date. Maybe not the date. But do you remember in your mind what you were doing and when you learned that you would be drafted? Well, I I knew I probably would be uh, because of my the age that I was, and and the way they were doing it. You know, I I I, I knew that I would. I just about knew that I was going to be drafted into the service. Before I was, you know. but of course when I went and signed up at the town of Columbus, why I was sure that that I was going to be. The uh, we were called into Columbus and signed up and interviewed and uh, checked you out to see if there's anything wrong with you physically. And uh, if if you pass physically, why well, that was it, you know. And I, of course, I was healthy. I didn't have no problems, and and so I I knew that no doubt I would be drafted. Did they give you an opportunity to select an area in the service to go into, or did they just put you where they thought that you would be? They just put you where they wanted you. Well, when I first went in. I went to South Dakota. I got on the train with the, the whole trailload of us. We stopped in Indianapolis and picked up a bunch of people then. And the boy that saved my life was one of them, but we picked up in Indianapolis, Wade Hibbs. And um, as we picked up two different places, we picked up more as we went. And we pulled into Sturgis. Sturgis, South Dakota, and a train pulled in the Sturgis, and we unloaded, and they took us up and out, marched us out to our barracks. And at that time, they had just built a bunch of new barracks out back of the old ones, and uh, of course we got put into new barracks, and uh, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of it. And that was our basic training, our basic training post. We had a big rifle range there and oh, a little bit of everything. You know. So during your basic training, how challenging was it to go from basically um, just a working, everyday working man or a farm boy yeah. to becoming a soldier? What were your drill instructor? What were your drill instructors like, and how challenging was it? No, I didn't have any problem with it really. I did it was just another another day's work, you know. Uh, the only thing different was the regiment. You know, you had just certain time for each thing, which you wasn't used to that. You was used to just doing whatever had to be done as long as it took to do it. But in the army, why uh, you did whatever the detail was was meant for. In, uh, in basic training, when it come to go to the rifle range, we had to go to the rifle range, and I had a period of time for that. And uh, out of, uh, I think it was, I forget how many hundred men, uh, I made a, a possible 183 out of a possible 200 on the rifle range, and uh, only three. Only three men was, was higher than I was out of that whole out of that whole bunch, because I was used to a gun and hunting, you know, and I was used to it. And but there was three guys that belonged to a gun club. That they was they they was a uh, hundred and see a uh, in a hundred and ninety somewhere. Three of them. They was three of us ahead of me. But anyway, I got a special pass for for being a high high score, and then I got to shoot my gun before the whole regiment 
they asked they asked me to shoot. They had two, three silhouette or five silhouette targets, and the M1 rifle held five bullets, and they had them lined up below their creek bank, and I was about oh, 400 yards away up along another bank. And my job, they they had a silhouette from the chest down to the waist, and they gave me five. Bullets with the that shows where the bullet went. You know what do they call it? Uh, tracers. Yeah, tracer bullets. They put five tracer bullets in my magazine, and I was to shoot at each one of these. And of course, I put each one on right between the shoulders. You know, uh, just and and they was they give me pretty high praise for that. But but that was a, a, I guess about the high point of it. <laughs> I remember Captain Gaines was a real strict officer. He was from Florida. And uh, he knew the men was going to gamble. Whether he gave permission to or not, they were going to do it. Uh, so he said he would rather have us doing it legally and honestly than do it behind his back. So he gave him a room down in the ammunition, down in the basement. Well, we, we had a great big three-story base uh, building it housed a whole company, plus their guns and, and ammunition. And he gave us a little storage room down in there. He didn't give it to me because I didn't gamble. But uh, we had a fellow by the name of Gallardo in Venezuela. They were two Mexican boys from California. And Gallardo was a professional gambler, and he ran a gambling outfit before he was into service. So Captain Gage let him run a, a gambling place. He had that little room there. And he said, the first time I hear of any trouble, that's the end of it. You won't be no more. And you know, there never was any trouble. They got a little, never was any fuss or anything about it. But uh, I never did gamble. But old Gardo was always trying to get me to gamble. And I said, I wouldn't do it. Because <laughs> they was there a year before we went in there. He was, they was already in the outfit. And uh, they knew the way. And he called me Jarvis. He couldn't say Jarvis, he said Jarvis. He said, now Jarvis, well, let me tell you, he said, when they call for a detail to work, he said, if we volunteer for it, he said, you volunteer. He said, if we don't, he said, you stay away from it. <laughs> they knew the ropes, you know, ahead of time. <laughs> they was a pair of characters, I'll tell you. <laughs> How did you get through it? So I, you mentioned earlier that you were just a farm boy, a yeah. working man, yeah. going into the service. Um, what do you remember about the things that you did or maybe mentally preparing yourself to get through your basic training? Oh, golly, I don't know. Uh, I guess I didn't think a whole lot about it. I just took it as it come. <laughs> Were there any troublemakers in your outfit that you remember, or even your squad? Uh, no, not really. Usually they were taken care of before they got to do, <laughs> do too much trouble. <laughs> so when you completed your basic training, did you think that you were ready for whatever challenges may be ahead? I guess I never even thought about it, really. I just, I just never, I don't think I even thought about it, whether one way or the other. After you completed your basic training, was there a ceremony that they held for your, your company after they completed basic? No, no, nothing other than just a, I will well say, call a, call a whole platoon together or whatever, you know, and, Tell them what, what was what and discharge it. That was it and let, let you go back to your quarters. What was your rank when you completed basic training? I don't know if I'd got, I think I got private first class PFC, I think, when I, when I got out of basic L. So yeah, I don't know. What did your parents think when you were on furlough, when you came back home, what were they thinking, or what did they say to you? Well, naturally, they were real glad to see me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your last moments with your parents before you left. Mm -hmm. did, did you did you hug your mom? Yeah, yeah, sure did. Yeah. Do you remember hugging her? Oh yeah, oh yeah. What were her emotions like? Oh, she was crying, of course. Yeah, yeah. How about your dad? 
Uh, my dad was something else. That's another subject. Keep it all off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Do you remember how you felt when you were hugging your mom and you're getting ready to see your parents? Yeah, I felt real bad. Why yeah. was that? Well, have to leave. Just have to leave. You know, I just. Uh, I was always a homebody. I never was away from home before I went to Arby. And uh, being home for 14 days, I'd have to leave, you know. I, it, uh, it was rough, real rough. Yeah. yeah. So you, you remember that hug you gave your mom then, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My mom had a rough life. She had a rough life. I was glad that we were able to keep her cup right here and live with us the last five years she lived. Had her trailer, a nice trailer right back here in the backyard. And I was awful glad that I got to do that much for her before she died. And well, she would get them old women and get them in our car and take them someplace. She was always hauling them somewhere. <laughs> Even when they didn't want to go, she made them go. <laughs> and our oldest daughter had left and went to Springfield, Missouri. And she drove that trip down there to her. Well, what, three times you went down there with them women? Yeah. <laughs> I was working at Seal Bill and I could go, you know, <laughs> on just <this> certain time. <laughs> yeah. So you, you remember, you don't quite remember who took you to the train station. But when you get on the train and you're headed back to the service, do you remember what you were thinking? Cause you know, at this point, you had just left your family. It was a very emotional experience. Yeah. And really, you don't know what's in store for you. No, you I just remember. Just like everybody else, you know, I just thought, well, you wonder if you're ever going to see him again. You know, I don't think that because you was in the army and you was going uh, headed for combat, and you just never knew you were going to see him again. That's yeah. So did yeah. your mother do anything special for you? Did she uh, write you? Did she have maybe a star in the window of your house that represented your service? Yeah, yeah. And she wrote to me. She wrote, she wrote to me, yeah. But, uh, so you get on a train, and where do they send you to next? Uh, I went back to South Dakota, I'm sure. And it wasn't long after that then. We were transferred from there to went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And we took our glider training down there, our airborne glider training. And, uh, well, we went to Cap McCall from Fort Bragg. We, we was with that very Fort Bragg very long. And then we went to Cap McCall, and that's where they had the special long uh, runways for uh, uh, towing gliders to get them off the ground. They had to have an extra long. And uh, we was uh, we was at about well I don't know probably a month or, well, at least a month or better. I was up eight times in a CG 4A glider. They towed by a C-47 airplane. They towed one. They could tow one or they could tow two at a time. And most of the time we just towed one one glider at a time. They had old 12 men, and. So the glider itself didn't weigh much. It wasn't too heavy. You know, they were a flimsy, real flimsy outfit. That's why they done away with the glider infantry because it was it, too many people got killed just landing. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a good, good, a good idea. So just like over, but they come in over to Sicily with the gliders. They landed. Some of them landed as high as. 300 feet out into the ocean, didn't even make it to shore. And the guys drowned. Some guys drowned in them, you know. Most of them got out, I guess, but there was a few drowned. It, uh, they wasn't a good idea. They done away with them completely. So what was it like being in these gliders? Can you tell us a little bit about that, what your experience was being up in a glider and how it worked? And who oh, drove it? it was a... It was an exciting ride. <laughs> what uh, we got, the glider picked it up with a tail, two guys behind each wing in front, and a guy with a tail, and picked it up and wheeled around the end of the runway, spotted it for the C-47, would taxi down and, and he'd wheel around, 
and you'd have to put the lock pin, slide in the lock pin in the, in the back of the C-47, and it went up and fastened in the front of the glider above the windshield. There was a, a special lock for it up there where it went. To, to, and the tow rope was a nylon, about a, oh, it was, it was a good inch and a half, two inches around, a nylon rope. And it was stretched twice its length itself. And when they'd take the glider off, that airplane would gun that thing up, the tail would come up, and when he start to go, that glider would start to move, and as it, as it went forward, the further you went, of course, the faster it went. You got up so far that the actually the glider would be airborne, they would help pull the tail of the air C-47 up, you know, so it would be up ready to take off. And when he'd get there high enough, of course, he was looking at his instruments, and when he got high enough for evolution to get off the ground, why well, he would pull her back, take the plane off. They both go, go take off together. So who, there was a guy that drove the glider? Was there like an opera, like a cockpit in there? That yeah, there was a, a pilot. Yeah, yeah, there was a pilot. Yeah. Yeah, they had uh, the, 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 whoever the sergeant was was the squad. He acted as a co-pilot. They had dual controls in those gliders, believe it or not. They had dual controls in them. Well, I don't know, but they did. They wouldn't, didn't have to have no reason for it, but they did. No. Yeah. So it sounds like your role changed a little bit. Uh, you went from just infantry, a mortar man, and then you were with a unit that was airborne in a way? Yeah, that was airborne unit, yeah.